Well, welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming today. Um, I think we'll probably get started here. If a few folks come on in late, I think we can all turn and laugh at them. No, just kidding. We'll just let them sit in the back. Uh, welcome to Breaking News. I really wanted to have the Breaking Bad symbol, with the, but <laughs> some copyright issues um, prevented that. So we're not going to... We're not going to uh, try and push that envelope, but thanks for coming. Um, this is a panel discussion about how news content is an important part of the university's story. Um, and today's discussion is going to focus on how to identify stories, experts, elements in your colleges and units, your areas of the, uh, the university to score headlines in local and regional and maybe even the national media. Uh, my name is Steve Smith. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the news director here at UNL. And uh, I'll be moderating today's panel. Uh, we have some excellent folks from our campus who can discuss uh, their philosophies on news and how they work to get their stakeholders or themselves into, uh, into the public eye, in front of the public eye. So uh, without further ado, let's meet our panel. To my, uh, to my right here immediately is Wheeler Winston Dixon. And Wheeler is the Ryan Professor of Film Studies at UNL. He's an internationally recognized scholar and writer of film history, theory, and criticism. He's the author of about 7,000 books uh, and more than 70 articles on film. And he appears regularly in the national media, and that's really why Wheeler is here, to talk about um, how, he, how he kind of punches through that membrane and gets into the media um, and builds his own kind of personal, um, personal brand basically. So he's a, he's a really great example, and I hope he can talk from a faculty sense. Uh, try. Okay, you're going to try. That's all we can ask. Um, we, we consider Wheeler a, what we call a perpetual placement. That is, we don't have to do a lot of work with him anymore. He's, he's become recognized in, this field, in his field as an expert, and people seek him out instead of us having to constantly push him. So uh, I'd like to, you know, hopefully Wheeler can talk a little bit about how that has occurred over the years. Good shot. Uh, to his right, Molly Brummond. And Molly Brummond is Assistant Dean of Student and Alumni Relations and Annual Giving to the University of Nebraska College of Law. Molly is, uh, I would say she's a tireless advocate for her college's faculty. And some of, some of the faculty over there are preeminent experts in their field. And uh, hopefully we can talk a little bit about some of those folks and how Molly has worked with them and the media and UCOM to get those people into the media. And how she watches headlines and watches trends in the media to, uh, to get her folks out there. Uh, to her right is Vicki Miller. As many of you know Vicki. She's the Director of Research Communications and the Office of Research and Economic Development. <coughs> Vicki is a veteran newswoman who handles many, many tasks. And I'm not sure if I got enough many's in there, Vicki. In a world uh, where UNL's reputation is often measured by how our research is perceived, uh, Vicki is just a master of breaking down the daunting nature of some of these scientific stories. And so Vicki can talk a little bit about how that can be done. Because those, those things can be intimidating. And, uh, and Vicki's a master at, like I said, at breaking those down. She's great at raising UNL's research profile nationally, locally, and internally, too. And last we have Makita Rivas, who is a uh, communications associate with the School of Natural Resources. Makita, in less than a year on the job, has established herself as a uh, prolific news gatherer and a storyteller at SNR. Whether it's a story about faculty research, a classroom feature, or a personality profile, Makita just knows how to seek out and deliver a lot of different types of news for many different types of audience. So let's welcome our panel. I'd like to, you know, I'd like to start by giving each panelist a chance to further introduce themselves and maybe just give a few thoughts about, um, about their role and uh, what they do. So Wheeler, do you want to start? Okay, well, um, we're supposed to do this because they're recording this, so we have to drag the mic over here. Um, so my name is Wheeler Winston Dixon. My field is film studies, and basically what I concentrate on is national placement as opposed to local placement of stories. Um, I accomplish that really through having a blog, which is quite visible and which is on the New York Times blog roll. And w I update that with content on a regular basis. I mean, two or three times a week, sometimes two or three times a day. Um, I also have written a lot of books. I've written a lot of articles. Um, also, um, I edit a magazine along with Gwendolyn Foster called Quarterly Review of Film and Video. And so I keep myself out there is really basically it. But I don't, I'm not chained to the computer. It may surprise you to know that I don't have a cell phone. 
it may surprise, and I'm totally opposed to them, seriously, because when I'm thinking, I want to think, and I don't want to be interrupted. It may surprise you to know that I don't have a Twitter account, and also that I'm directly opposed to Facebook, okay? I will have nothing to do with these data mining operations, okay? But at the same time, the people I am in contact with are the people who are in the print media, and they contact me all the time. And there's also a great service called ProfNet, which asks you queries, and they just pop into my box every single day, and I respond to those. But the main thing that you need to do to get national placement, I've covered, I've discovered, is really to um, be able to pithily, when reporters call you up, they're looking really for a pull quote. You know, they're looking for what they need. So if you spend a lot of time talking about something, you're going to dilute your impact and you're actually going to decrease your chances of making it into the story. So I have a little trick that when somebody calls me up, for example, somebody called me up from the LA Times just a couple of days ago for a story about this producer who's trying to make a comeback. Um, and so I do a little trick and the trick is, um, okay, you know, I can talk only right now, even if that's not true. I say, I can talk only right now because I have something I have to do almost immediately and tomorrow is completely booked up. So you get me now or you get me not at all. So that establishes a sense of urgency right off the bat. And so then I say, okay, well, I have like about 10 minutes. What do you want to know? And so then I let them question me and I give them as brief quotes as I can and I get off the phone because I've discovered that that gives you a much higher success rate because you're giving them less to work with, it's more focused and they think it's more valuable than if you're sitting there chatting with them for a half an hour. So that's really it. I mean, and, and film studies is, you know, is something that also, as I'm sure the rest of the panelists will tell you, you have to keep abreast of the field and you have to know exactly what's going on. And of course, most of it now happens on the web. Print is really pretty much going away, uh, much to my sorrow. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, you know, the newspapers still publish and they publish now online. So if you, you have to keep on top of these things. And so that's what, I, that's what I basically do. So we'll talk more later. OK. Hi, I'm Molly Brummond. And I'm, as Steve told you, I'm with the College of Law. And um, my role with the college has actually changed a little bit in the last few months. And I, for the last three years, I've been the, I was the director of communications, which is how I started to work with Steve. And now I'm the assistant dean of student alumni relations. But the one piece of communications that I retained was, print, um, was news and, and media placement. Um, and I guess I'm here to talk to you about just how you can help faculty members. Um, and I, I would say that one of the advantages that I have is that I, too, am a lawyer. And so I know what our faculty, I have a pretty good understanding. I think it's important as communicators to do your best to have a really good understanding of what the areas of expertise are that your faculty have. Um, because then when you're, like when I'm looking at the, the kind of news developments, I almost immediately can identify who I can go to to ask if they want to be if they want to speak out on something and if they want to be made available to the media and we can do it preemptively as opposed to kind of trying to catch up once the story is already broken um, so I'll leave it at that and let the other two introduce themselves and I can talk more about that um, as the panel progresses I'm Vicki Miller, and uh, I'm with the Office of Research. Uh, by way of introduction, um, I've, I've been at the university a couple of years and um, started out and <laughs> did my first 18 years here as the science writer for the Institute of Ag and Natural Resources. Um, I, I'm, an, I'm a newsie by training, uh, worked for the AP, edited, uh, was the editor of some daily and weekly newspapers. Uh, before jump, jumping ship and going into this side of the operation. Uh, uh, but one of the things that I hope that I can perhaps help you with today is um, maybe we can visit a bit about the sometimes unique challenges um, that are involved with reporting research uh, and, and, and trying to craft a story or news around something that most people know very little about. So um, I, I hope to visit a, a bit about that. Uh, for now, that's all you need to know. 
Hi, everyone. I am Makita Rivas. Um, I serve as the Communications Associate for School of Natural Resources on East Campus. Um, a nice way of putting it is I'm a one-woman news machine for the school, uh, which houses nine majors, six units, a little under 400 undergrad and graduate students, and over 100 faculty and staff. So um, even though it is a little overwhelming, it's also a very exciting and endlessly fascinating place to work and to have the school as a beat because there's no shortage of news stories to mine from, and um, there's always something going on. So hopefully today I can help some people figure out how to sort of navigate um, the overwhelming, I guess, nature of working in a large department and figuring out how to pick through the stories and prioritize them and you know get them the best play possible. Thanks, guys. Um, if anyone has a question in the audience as we're going, feel free to raise your hand and I'll attempt to find you and uh, call you out. If otherwise. Um, uh, you can tweet, of course you can tweet. Um, <laughs> use the hashtag UNLSM, UNLSM for this. And uh, Tyler there in the back will, uh, will flag me down and read out the question. So if you're too shy to raise your hand, you can tweet. But I'll start with you know, kind of an, uh, maybe an obvious question and, and I'll just throw it out to the panel, whoever wants to, to grab this. Um, well, how do you know when something is newsworthy? Um, what elements in your mind, you know, make up a research study or a classroom feature or for Wheeler, you know, for something you're doing that's uh, notable enough that you think rises to the level of news? You know, I'm thinking note ver noteworthy versus newsworthy. There's a big difference between noteworthy and what makes it into the news. So what is, what is how do you know when something's newsworthy? Anybody want to take a crack at that one? Well, you know, we used to call it the sniff test. Uh, does anybody care? Is anybody out there? Uh, the, and I, lo I love your explanation of noteworthy because we work in a world where there, there are accomplishments that need to be noted and we have some increasingly effective vehicles to do that. Uh, UNL Today, uh, Scarlet, our social media, your college and department, web pages and newsletters, etc. And then the, the whole issue of what's really news and for me, the acid test is, does the, does the rest of the world care about this? Do they, must they know? Uh, and, and I have a fairly small range of must we knows. That, and then there's the other, the other area I'm afraid that we all deal with, which is the news that we must tell people, right? And that perhaps that's the most challenging. But it really is, does anybody outside the folks who are immediately involved care about it? Is it a compelling story? Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Um, you know, when I'm assessing a story's newsworthiness, I'm in turn assessing how, what its impact is potentially and who it's going to reach and speak to in the long term. You know, is it just relevant for SNR, for East Campus, for the university community, for the city, state, and so forth? So I think the larger that potential impact is, the more newsworthiness it has, and therefore the more I'm going to prioritize it. You know, something that maybe is like a classroom feature or a student profile story, in those instances, I'm looking for a very unique footprint and, you know, an interesting story that's never been told before. You know, what makes this student special? What makes this class interesting or one of a kind? And, you know, if it hasn't been told before, I want to tell that story. Or if it has, if it hasn't been a while, I want to follow up on it. So those are sort of some of the things that I look for in, in newsworthiness. Um, I, I think that the most useful thing for me, quite frankly, is my blog. Because what I, and, and the blog, there are a lot, a lot of blogs, but mine's been around for about four or five years. And then I was lucky enough that Dave Carr, who used to work for the New York Times and now who works for the Museum of Modern Art as a film curator, uh, liked it so much that he put it on the New York Times blog roll and then it really took off. So now I'm getting about 20,000 hits a day. But what I do is I only write about the stuff that I want to write about. 
I don't write about something because it's necessarily in the news, you know. Um, I'm, and, and so there's a wide range of things, so I'm not sort of chasing the news, you know, which, which is a destructive way to approach it. The other thing, of course, that I guess I wanted to note is that when you're dealing with the national media, it doesn't really do much good to pitch yourself because they're not really interested in you. They're interested in your ideas, if they will fit into their story. And you also have no idea what they're going to pick and choose of whatever you tell them, how you're going to be represented. So I found, quite frankly, that my, my, um, my, I, I publish mostly my articles online um, in various different journals, like Film International and stuff. And so people read those and contact me, or they read my blog or whatever. But it's getting yourself out there so that the people will then call you up for various different ideas about films. And my area, of course, is film studies and things like that. Lately, I've been doing a lot of work on streaming, because streaming media, of course, is the way that everything is now being delivered. And I just wrote a book called Streaming, in fact, last year, which has gotten a lot of good press. So I get a lot of questions about that. So the question is, you have to get your material out there, and you have to let people know it. And at the same time, you can't really push yourself. You have to be available. But at the same time, you have to sort of have some kind of distance so they're reaching out to you because then you're more valuable. So a couple of different things come to mind. One thing that I've worked really hard at is to develop really good relationships with the faculty members that, with whom I work. Um, and when they have books published or they have an article that's published, I make sure that we you do our best to push it out at least into the streams within the university community so that they are at least recognized um, within the re university um, community. And then if there are different, um, you know, kind of trade publications, if there's other ways that I can promote those sorts of things, um, then I do that. And what that has helped me do is um, develop just a really good level of rapport with people because then they kind of tell me um, how they see the news developing and then I know what to be watching for and I know what expertise they can bring to it and I can try and make matches in that way. Um, so that's kind of from the faculty perspective and from the college perspective, um, since I have been at the College of Law, there, I mean, there's been tremendous um, pressure on law schools nationwide. Um, just because the number of people taking the LSAT and even considering law schools are going down nationwide and so the competition for students is really fierce. And so when that's your story, um, that helps you think, of, it helps me frame about frame what I think is newsworthy because we're looking at ways that differentiate us from the law schools that we're competing against. And so for instance, we're, we're the only law school in in the Big Ten and really one of the only one public law schools that requires our first year students to take an international law course. So that's a that's a big deal but I don't know that it would have necessarily been something that I was really really pushing if I hadn't have been thinking it, about it through this frame of what differentiates us from all of our competitors and that one overarching kind of framework is how I figure out what's newsworthy because that is what the dean and really the faculty I mean we need students and we need to compete hard for students and so we need our placements need to be about what the college is doing that's kind of cutting edge and innovative and so I'm looking at not only does that shape my messaging and help me figure out what's newsworthy it also helps me determine what kinds of publications I need to to have those placements in because I don't know a lot I mean I don't know if our audience the 22 year olds that we're trying to recruit are reading the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times um, so I mean it would be great if they were <laughs> but chances are they're reading the National Jurist or pre-law magazine and so a placement it, that's Help it, for some of the stories that I'm trying to frame, that is of more value to me at this time than um, maybe something else. And and communicating that clearly to the dean is also something that I'm constantly doing. Mm -hmm. Mm 
It, it's uh, in our office when we're thinking and evaluating what is new is whether we pursue something, we often use three words. Is it the first? Is it the best? Is it the only? And so um, that's something that I think kind of you're talking about here, about how we are differentiating ourselves from the rest of the country. First, best, only. Those are three quick uh, guideline words that we often use. Um, Vicki, you, you deal with stories related to research funding more than probably anyone on campus. And she, as she smiles as I say that. Um, are there special challenges, considerations that we need to keep in mind when we're preparing stories for big grant announcements? I know there are folks in this room that have, you know, had to think about how to, how to prepare for those kinds of news stories. And what, what, do we, what do we have to consider in those situations? Well, first of all, thank you to all of you folks who, who, who take on uh, the task of trying to um, get a well-timed uh, grant announcement story out there. Uh, I, I think the first thing that, uh, and probably the most important, is timing. And by that I mean uh, it is not unusual for uh, one of our faculty to receive an email from a program officer at a, a federal funding agency saying, hey, we're going we're gonna to fund your project. And they are understandably really excited, and they email their dean and their department head, and we're off to the races. Um, and so, uh, for example, Sherry gets an email, and it says, woohoo, look at this, big win. Get that news out there. And we're good, you know, we're good reporters and communicators, and we're going to do that for them. Um, and I would just ask one thing, check with us first. Uh, <laughs> and most of the folks, uh, I, I may be preaching the choir here, but uh, it's, it's the, the note from the program officer, while well, exciting news, um, is not a f the official grant notice. And, and we can't announce our grants publicly until they are actually awarded. And so um, Ashley Washburn, my colleague in, in research Ashley. communications, and I would be happy if you have a question, if somebody comes to you, just say, hey, we'll check. Uh, and we can we can check that fairly quickly for you. And if there's something um, uncertain in the listing, we can check with the director of sponsored programs, and we can get you an answer pretty quickly. So at at the worst, you have to say, hey, this is great news, but we need to wait a little while. So so the timing issues is is, is sort of routine, but not only as long as we do it. If we don't do it, we get calls from funders saying we haven't given you that grant, and we may not do that now. So. We, we never want that to happen. Um, a couple of other thoughts on, on, on the whole grant announcing funding. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a news person, so to be honest, I, it's better news in my mind when we can talk about the outcome of work. So, you know, we got this funding and now we've done this that makes a difference and what the impact is. That, that may, almost always makes a better story. But there are times when we need to to tell the other story. There, there are a few times, rare, but a, f a few times when the size of the grant or the, the potential that it allows us uh, is the news itself. So if we get a $10 million grant and we can open a new uh, a, a center that we have not had before, that's big news. Uh, but still always, really, it's what, what can we, what will we be doing for the greater good w with that money. Um, you know, m my boss, Prem Paul, always says it's not, it's not about the money. It's about what the money allows our faculty to do. Um, so so th th those are a couple of rules. The other thing that I'd mention real quickly is that uh, <clears throat> there's not a one-size-fits-all number for grants. We still apply the news rule. I mean, is this n newsworthy? Uh, and, and I know that's, that's the toughest one for you all, for all of us, because it sure is newsworthy to faculty A who just got this grant. And all grants are important because they further the mission of the university. But sometimes they're more noteworthy than newsworthy. And, and that's where we do kind of a delicate dance with our, with our faculty and with our, um, our administrators. Uh, but I do want to note that all grants aren't created equal. equal. So um, somebody in physics gets a $200,000 grant from NSF. That is great news. 
probably not newsworthy. I mean, it's, it's a relatively s small amount of money in the hard sciences. Someone in history or English gets a $200,000 grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. That's a big deal. I mean, seriously, that is, it's not fair, life isn't fair, but there's a real inequity, as Wheeler will certainly attest, in the, in the available funds for scholarship and research across disciplines. So, you know, if you have a question about that, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, I'm, we're here to, to try to sort that out. I wish I had a magic rule that if it's this, then this trigger, triggers this. I don't. Uh, I, I would just caution, I think, in general, that there is a fatigue level that will pop up fairly quickly in the media with Yahoo Grant of the Week kinds of stories. And so we, we try, in the Office of Research, to limit those, uh, it, the ones that we're responsible for. We, we, we try to pick our, pick our placements pretty carefully. Uh, and, and I guess if if you all can think about it that way, uh, I would encourage you to do so. But if nothing else, think about the story. What's the story? Is the story that you got this grant? The real story is what you can do with it. And our faculty, are, you know, once you sit down and talk, this is their work. This is their life's work. We have incredibly bright, intelligent, hardworking people. And if you can sit down and talk with what they do about, about their life's work, they will tell you often a very fascinating human interest story. I want to reiterate Molly's point. Uh, the better you know your faculty, and the better they understand the, their relationship with you, the better off you're going to be. Um, so success breeds success. So that's a really good point. Any questions, first of all, from the audience? It might be a good time for anyone. Any thoughts? So Molly, we were talking about placement. So, um, so there's some like, there's some in-house stories, though, you can tell, right? Absolutely. So when you talk about placement. So there's stuff you can put in-house, and maybe like UNL today, or mm -hmm. you know your own college news stuff that are in-house newsworthy versus external. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And what I found is when, um, when I make sure to do those in-house things, that helps me build just a rapport with the faculty member because it it communicates to them that I am working for you. I want you to I want you your success to be known, and so as a result of that, they are more likely when something happens to come right to me to let me know. Um, and so I have found that just by taking the steps to make sure that things get to Steve or to UNL today or submit something to the Scarlet or you know make sure that it that it's communicated to the person that runs our website or I mean all of those things I mean we have an internal college newsletter communicating to the student that their professor was um, you know an article was accepted for publication all of those things just breed um, rapport and then the result of that rapport is just a a clear exchange of information and more likelihood that I'm going to find out right away what's going on. So do you also use the same philosophy of newsworthy uh, first or do you use that same principle? Yeah. Uh, in-house? Yeah. In yeah. I mean, yes. I mean, you kind of, I think probably for every college or department, it's probably different. Um, but you kind of, it, you can, it doesn't take long to kind of deter, to develop kind of a gut reaction to yes, this is going to, this is kind of the process that we follow. You know, that's, that's, that's a good point. Molly, you've been there how long now? Three and a half years. Okay. Yeah. And you've, you, you were a lawyer, so you kind of had an in with the other lawyers, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. So, I mean, so it, yeah. We've got Makita, who's been here less than a year. Are, are you, am I shortchanging your time, your tenure here? Uh, no, less than a year, okay. about seven months. So how do you build rapport? How do you, you know, because I was national news editor before this, which Leslie Reed does now, and I would approach some professors and they'd be like, nah, I don't want to deal with the media. It's, it's kind of demeaning. I'd rather write for my, associate, or my, my fellow professors. That's, that's the audience I want. And, and you know, how are you, how do you build this rapport? You know, I think you kind of have to prove yourself with the content that you 
produce. Um, that's a lesson that I have learned and am, am learning. I've definitely um, experienced some aversion and disinterest in, you know, faculty sharing their work. I think it comes from a spotlight shyness at times. I've noticed that some faculty members in the hard sciences are just very focused and dedicated to their work. And the last thing they want to do is answer questions from a pesky communicator. So, you know, I've learned <laughs> to um, not take that so personally. And I've also realized that having a sample story or press release to provide them with if they are a little hesitant is really helpful because um, it kind of demonstrates and gives them an idea of what you're hoping to create for them, how this piece of media can help them and advance their work or research. So being able to showcase hey, here's an article I've already written, kind of similar, this is what I'm hoping to create for you. I want to get your work out in the media. Um, I think sort of decreases their hesitance a little bit. Um, you know, it's, it's important to make it less about you as a person. This is about you and your work. And I think when you phrase it that way, they're a lot more open-minded and a lot um, more willing, and that rapport sort of starts to build. Um, I'd say my last line of defense is ringing in my boss, the director, so he can kind of give them the little nudge that they need if, if they don't want to work with me. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a constant struggle. I think we have a little bit of Nebraska and all, although we're all from different places, we kind of have that, aw, shucks, it's not really that big a well, deal. Can I comment on sure. that? Because lawyers are not. Are not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I take it back, I take it back. <laughs> I mean, the... What I, what I found when I started was a real, I mean, I think that generally my impression is anyway that academics are, can, are hesitant sometimes to talk to me, but lawyers are also really hesitant to talk to me because they don't want to be taken out of context. And so once I determined that that was one of the biggest barriers, Steve came over and did, we had a, a brown bag lunch and media training with some just basic rules and once we did that then there was a little like the barrier came down a little bit and then when we had some I mean because our cha I mean the law touches everything right and so it would drive me nuts when we have um, you know, the pipeline discussion happening. And we have Sandy Zelmer, who is a, you know, water law expert and just natural resource expert, and we're not getting the call to talk about that. That would drive me just crazy. Um, so the, the media training helped because then it was like, um, I mean, what Steve says is come up with your three points and just have them in front of you and come back to them. Come back to those three points. Every question that they ask, just come back to one of the three points that you want to make. And so then people felt a little more like they were prepared, that they weren't going to get taken out of context. And um, so that barrier came down a little bit. And then once we had people start to get placement and then get recognition for it for it for the in, from the internal sources well then the gloves were off and it was like this competitive thing because my faculty is very competitive with each other and that's what we want to get to right we want to get to yeah, that yeah yeah well i i i want to reiterate a couple of points there and i think wheeler hit it right on the head when he started talking about this notion of less being more. Yeah. That's one of the things we really, I really emphasize with researchers when they're doing interviews is that have those three, you know, I know your three points, within those three points, figure out ways to say the same thing three different ways. I mean, really, so that Sooner or later, somebody's going to snag onto the sound bite, and whatever, every one they grab, because as Wheeler points out, you have no control. You don't know what of what you say they're going to snag. So st staying on message is, is really important. Um, that's sometimes a bit har harder, I think, for um, hard scientists, because they really, really 
want to explain this to you. <laughs> they, can, they can change the world. They can change the world if they just give them two hours. Yeah. And I believe it's in about 50, how long is a class period? 55 minutes, 50 minutes? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so they, they need more help. And the, the truth is, because film is, because I, I go to movies. Right. I have hired an attorney. I have never, never laid a nano layer on graphene. <laughs> <laughs> and to be honest, that took me a really long time to know what that meant. So, so there, there, there are unique challenges. Uh, but, but one of the things I, I see, you've, I see reluctance, but now I have seen, I also see the opposite, which is kind of problematic. And it's that <laughs> everybody has a great story to tell, and they want you to tell it now. Yeah. And you know, not like grants, not all stories are created equal. So that goes back to this great tool, the tools that we have on campus to help people, to, to celebrate people's successes, right? And I can tell you that because of what Molly does, uh, I happened to notice some work that Sandy was doing that I otherwise wouldn't have known about. So there, believe me, when, when something's in UNL today, it's not just a pat on the back to your faculty member, although that's important, by the way. Uh, but, but other folks do hear about it. And you know, maybe somebody who's working in natural resources on research will say, well, I want to collaborate with, with Zelmer. Sure. And you know, that, that's, that's a win-win for everybody. I guess, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, just had, a, just had a quick question. Uh, all of you have been talking about how less is more and not chasing stories and all that, and it seems like it comes down to having an identity. But how do you go about forming that identity when it comes to communications? Because what you're going to put out there, a lot of times, is going to be how people see you and how you represent it. So you've got to have a strong identity first, and how do you go about that? Well, I think that one of the most important things is, is you know, is you have to have, first off, a professional web page. You have to have something that looks reasonably slick, and you can't do it yourself, so that's, that's the one thing. So you have to have that. But I think it's also, going back to what, what Vicki was saying, you have to, you can control how, what appears to be with you in the press if you keep the whole thing completely laser focused. And if you just repeat the thing over and over again. And getting yourself out there is really a matter, I think, of doing the work and then making sure that that work is, I mean, in my field, is placed in as many online publications as possible, and at the same time, not behind paywalls. You know, I'm not really involved in this to make a lot of money. I'm involved in film because film is my passion, and film history, theory, and criticism. I mean, I'm, I'm production, I know all about, and I've done it. But I'm really interested in, you know, in, in, in how film works with society. And of course, right now, the momentous digital shift, which everything is, your film is going away, everything's going digital, you know, and there's all kinds of great stories about that, like the largest camera rental house in, in Los Angeles, Burns and Sawyer, just sold off all their film cameras because nobody's using them anymore. I mean, everything is digital, and, and the studios are destroying their 35 millimeter prints. So, you know, every time that you get some information like that, then you can put that in a blog or you can put that in an article, you know. I mean, and I publish a couple of times a week, you know, and so then when you do that, then you get out there. But I guess one thing I wanted to talk about th with Vicki is sort of what I call the etiquette of responding to these things. At this point, what happens to me, quite frankly, is that people, you just put out a lot of content and people say, well, I read something here and I read something there, so maybe you'd like to have something to say about that, right? So then using all the previous rules, keep it very focused, you know, make sure that your stuff is perceived as valuable. But again, you can't contact them. But after they've contacted you, there's, there's several things. Respond immediately. You know, I mean, I check my computer like three or four times, maybe five times a day. And if somebody gets something, you know, I, I will respond immediately. Even if I'm not going to comment, I'll respond immediately and say, sorry, I really can't do this, but thank you for thinking of me. And in the future, if you have something that would be more along my lines, maybe we can get back together again, and I appreciate your interest, right? But also after the interview, I immediately shoot off a follow-up email in which I have my complete block of contact information how I would like to be referred to, the fact that I'm with the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Very right? important point right there. Exactly right there. Yeah, because, <laughs> because I can't tell you how many times even the local papers have screwed my name up because it's Wheeler Winston Dixon. So I've been Winston Dixon Wheeler. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? And so That's the thing cool. is that, so what I do is I always send them the block afterwards and I say, here's, here's the block 
please use this, this is my name, this is how I wish to be referred to, right? And send me a link, right? And then that gets an established thing going. And I keep a file, a separate file of all the media contacts. But I found that going back to them and saying, well, would you be interested in a story on something doesn't work. You have to more or less be out there, create the work, and create sort of where people will say, well, he'll have a quote about that, and then they'll go for it. And then you just give them the quote, and that's it. But the main thing is you really got to put yourself out there, you know, and that's, and that's really it. But I think one thing I was thinking about when you were talking about the fact that you're a lawyer is you also have to be very careful about what you say. Yes. You know, you really have to, I mean, there's lots of stories that I turned down because a reporter or, and that's another thing, if a reporter, particularly in film, and I don't know how much this is in the hard sciences, but if they will suddenly start talking about something like Woody Allen, and then they'll go into scandal territory, mm -hmm. right? Yes. You know, and I say, well, I really don't, I don't have anything to say about that. You know, I really don't know anything about that. You know, I can't say anything about it. But the worst thing that you can say is no comment. Because no comment means you've got a comment, but you're withholding it. Holding it. Right? Yeah. And so that what I try to say is I really don't know anything about that. You know, and that, and that just shuts them right down because if I don't know anything about that, I don't and I just keep repeating it. That's it. So you really have to be careful. There's a great book called Say It Safely, which is a very old book, but it's a very useful book, and it tells you how to avoid traps like that. So there's all kinds of things to consider. You know, it's, an, it's a good question um, because... So No, if they want it, if they, there's, I mean, if, if, you know, entertainment media is totally different from what you guys are doing, so it's a, a different thing. But I mean, like, if it's, if, I mean, for example, there are certain sites that I won't even talk to, like TMZ. If you know what TMZ is, Three Mile Zone, right, which is all gossip <laughs> news media thing, I'm not even going to talk to them. Forget it. I mean, I just, I just flush their queries just like that because they're just interested in gossip and scandal, and I have no interest in being associated with that. So, um, but if, that, if that's what they want to talk about, you're not going to get them to talk about something else. I mean, you know, like TMZ is not interested in Woody Allen's movies. And they're not interested in, you know, anything he did, or they're not interested in, you know, they're only interested in, in, in scandal. So in that case, you just stay away from it, and then you brand yourself as someone who won't be associated with those sorts of publications. Or, yeah, coming and from the University of Nebraska, right, too. Right, exactly. And it's, it's, very, it's very useful. It's very useful. Yeah. Yeah. Very useful. You know, the, the question, you know, is a, it, it kind of, sort of highlights what's happened in higher ed and higher ed coverage in the last, I don't know, I don't know you can go back 40 years, 50 years, where um, I think the University of Illinois actually did a study on this that showed 50 years ago, most media outlets talked about universities. Now, higher ed coverage is smart guy has smart opinion. Can we, can we go talk to him about something? Right. right, the Larry Sabato thing where he's always on CNN talking about who's gonna win the election. So how do you guys uh, leverage that? You know, now you have to have personal brands for each professor. And I think that kind of gets to the point. How do, you got all these different personalities on campus. How do you make sure that UNL is represented in those, or your college is represented in them? Uh, what, what kind of tips and tricks do you have to, besides beating them over and say, make sure you say you're from the University of Nebraska? Well, one of the things I talk to both faculty and to our students about is, you know, you, you already have a personal brand. You just haven't maybe thought about it as a personal brand. And so um, what I tell people is, you know, you need to sit down and think about what your brand is and identify the things that you can do to support that brand. So Wheeler touched on your professional website and making sure that that is current. And so Vicki just gave me the highlight of my week by saying that the that our faculty website pages were all current because now all of our faculty are thinking about that as part of their their brand and one of the many tools that they have when we talk to faculty members we talk about you know do you want to have a blog do you want to be on twitter do you have a linkedin profile um 
you know, all of those things. I mean, even um, Wheeler's response that he gives to the reporters, that is a part of his brand because they know that they, that they can count on him. He's communicating something to them by doing that. So everybody has a brand. It's just whether or not you've put any like time into kind of thinking about what, what it is you want to be sure that you're communicating through that brand. Well, can I just can I just can I just respond to that? Why do you mean you only have five minutes? Because it's just one portion of our job where we do so many other things. It's well, I think I think we all do. I think I think I'm, I guess I'm going to say I think you have more time than you have, or else you're going to have the multitask. You know what I mean? I mean cause, because it's this morning. I mean you know yesterday I wrote an article. This morning I do do blog entries. Also I'm teaching. I'm here lecturing and stuff like that. You have to pack more in your day. The whole thing has sped up to a ridiculous rate. I mean, right, my favorite show right now is a show called At Midnight, which probably many of you probably never even heard of. It's just At Midnight, okay? And it moves at a pace which is just blinding. It's on Comedy Central, and it's after Colbert and Stewart, okay? And it's At Midnight, and it comes on, and the guy's opening intro is, it's 11.59 and 59 seconds, and now it's At Midnight. And that's the speed at which it moves. So in order to do this sort of thing, you have to be prolific, you have to create an enormous amount of content, and you have to do it consistently and all the time. But you have to love what you're doing, right? I mean, if I didn't enjoy doing the work that I'm doing, then it wouldn't be, you know, if I, I can't write to order, I can't write about things that I don't want to write about. But the main thing is that you have to put some content out there, and you have to learn how to, to, to also what I call manuscript management. In other words, I'm the only one who can write my stuff, but other people can type it, right? I handwrite everything. So other people can type it. Um, people can do the tech work on my blogs. People can do the tech work on my websites. So as long as I provide the content, right, then what other people do to format that for me and stuff like that, which is not that expensive. This is the other thing. I mean, I don't know if any of you know about a, a site called Fiverr. Does anybody here know about Fiverr? Okay. Fiverr does amazing gigs for five bucks a pop. People will design websites, people will create software, people will do all kinds of things. As long as it's your content, having somebody else do the work of getting it out there for you is very useful. So, you know, and even though I don't tweet myself, I can hire other people to tweet for me. So, you know, it's, it's really, you know, I think it's really a question of, you know, how you want to allocate your time, but I, but I would say that it's just obvious to me that everything is speeding up to a place that's just, you know, and it's just going to get faster. We have a question over here. Faster. Sherry? I was just going to ask Wheeler if he could come to the College of Business and say what he just said. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. you can he, he does have an uh, honorarium. You, that you, can you, can you, can you can repeat it to him. That's him. fine. You it's going to be on the web. You can, you, can, you, can, you can repeat it to them. But I mean, that's really, that's the thing that, I, that I've learned is that, you know, that it's really, it's, it's right. And of course now, you know what the kids are all saying, picks or it didn't happen, yeah. you know? I mean, now nobody has any more time to read, right. right? So now the whole thing is Instagram, right? So that's really it. I mean, it's just, it's just you know, you really have to, I mean, it's, it's, it's a process of being continuously available and providing content continuously, but at the same time controlling the thing. So that's why I don't tweet because I might say something stupid, <laughs> right? Seriously, you know? I, yeah. I, 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 I give myself time to think about it, right? And then I put it out, right? So that I always try to maintain control of content, and that's why also I don't have a cell phone, so I have time to think. Um, I just wanted to touch on that too. Um, some of the our faculty have had great success when we're talking about blogs or Twitter blogs. They'll use it as an opportunity to get a student involved. Um, so Richard Moberly is one of our professors. He's an expert on um, national security law and whistleblowers. 
And so, I mean, he'll have one of his students say, and he has, you know, Google search terms that are set. So if there's an article that comes out that touches on one of his areas of expertise, you know, he gets it and he can <coughs> assign it to a student and say, we should, we should be blogging about this. Or it might, he might see the article and he might just think, I don't want to blog about it, but I'm going to tweet this out. And and make sure that my followers and all he tweets about are his areas of, of expertise. That's all he tweets about. He doesn't tweet about Nebraska football or any of that. It's just strictly his areas of expertise. Mm -hmm. And so the people that follow him, uh, you know, are interested in what he has to say about that particular thing. But he uses students and uses it as a way to engage students and give them an opportunity to think about things the way he's to learn about how he's thinking about things. Well, let me just jump Vicky in. had a point quick oh, before sorry, that. Sorry. sorry. Yeah, uh, excuse me. I, I, first of all, I, I wanted to go back to your question. Are, are you a faculty member? Me? Uh-huh. No. no. Uh, are you a communicator? I am the graduate recruitment coordinator. And you do a lot of stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so so there, there may be a difference between how Wheeler can manage his day and how you can manage your day. What I would suggest is you sit down with whomever is your boss, whether it's the dean or your, your department head or your school chair, what, whatever, and say, you know, tell me what you want to have happen. Because if rec recruitment's the top priority, then, then that tells you a lot. If uh, communicating on the reaching students is the top priority, there's a whole set of things to be done. That, that I think you prioritize. If the, uh, you know, the biggest deal is faculty recognition or promoting research, I mean, those, those are different kinds of things. But if you're in that uh, situation where you, you feel like you can't be all things to all people, uh, I think you have to ask for guidance and try to match your, your efforts to the expectations. And, Molly has talked about that. I think Sherry is someone who does a really good job of being tuned into her dean. So very quickly, I wanted to address that. Yeah. One other thing, and that is um, we talked about getting faculty to agree to do stories with this. There's one, there is a huge caution that I want to offer. Do not go out there and talk somebody into doing a news release with you who's not going to talk to the media when they call. As yeah. Wheeler said, you return those calls. And if you're not willing to take that time, and, and do that, for goodness sakes, don't ask Leslie to promote it nationally, because all, all we're going to do is up, you know, burn some bridges. So See, and, that, and, that, and just jumping in on that, what that does is that only damages you, but it damages the university. Yes, I absolutely. I mean, basically, if you put somebody out there as a potential news source and they don't follow through, then that's, that's, not, that's not a good thing. But I wanted to jump into something that Molly was saying, and that is that Google Scholar is a really useful tool that you can Google yourself and see where you're being cited. So then people, you can see what other people are taking your material and then you creating new content out of that. So then you can respond to that content, right? So you can see what's going on. And also having search terms set up on Google search for topics that you're interested in is, is another thing. Also, you should also, of course, as a default, you should have a Google set up for yourself so that you're constantly getting hits throughout the day and you should adjust that so that it's giving you instantaneous feedback not like feedback every 24 hours you know because 24 hours and you miss a news cycle i mean a news cycles now are in minutes so so it's really you really have to respond i mean that really is the key and people used to say you have a one day so it's a one day story it's, yeah you know? right it's now it's about a 12 hour now, story now it's about yeah. a 15 minutes we story. have a, we have about 5 minutes left is there uh, any other questions from the audience or any other thoughts yes Hmm. Good question. Thank Art you. Art scientists, by chance? <laughs> um, you know, the, the process that Makita just explained, I think, is you're, you're, you're operating against type in those cases. I've had the opportunity to oper operate against type as a science writer most of the time. These are people who want to talk to their peers. They're very introverted. They're afraid of the media. They've I guarantee you, if you do a media training, every one of them has a horror story to tell. And so my rule is, when I do that, is we've all had bad experiences. We're here to make sure that doesn't happen again. So let's start there. Um, and you can cover a lot more ground. Uh, but, but I do think you, one of the things is if there's, if there's a significant story and it's going uh, out locally or nationally, 
get a hold of Steve or Leslie, uh, and and people will sit down and actually talk to the to the faculty member and give them a little coaching. I mean, I wish we could. Tr I wish we could train every new assistant professor who comes in at new faculty orientation. Uh, we can't. Um, we, we need to do more of that. Steve sure, and I have yeah. talked about it, mm -hmm. but but we can <clears throat> do some hand holding at the time. Now, does that talk them into initially doing the story? Uh, m probably, maybe not. Maybe not. And we can't just say, well, we're, we're going to work with the folks who like working with the media, because that cuts out a whole lot of really significant work that's underway at the that's university. Right. Yeah, but, right. but certainly, we don't want to call attention to somebody who's either unwilling or uncomfortable. I did an interview. It was a great story. I was just like so excited. It was a major breakthrough in biochemistry. I'm ready to go. And at the end, I said to this guy, hey, so if this all works out, talk, tell me about the p potential outcome. And he said, ma'am, don't trivialize my science by asking me to speculate on practical outcomes. Right on. And I said, sir, don't you ever say that to a real reporter. And you are a land grant scientist. So uh, we didn't do that story. But you know, p backing off what you're saying, I mean, picking up, just want to quickly comment that Einstein only said two words on film. In the, all of his entire career, there's only two words of him speaking on film. All he says is, I agree. That's it. That's it. And the newsreel crews were badgering him for years. And of course, obviously, he was big news for most of his life. But they could never get him to say anything. He refused to do all the interviews and everything. And the only thing in the march of time somebody would ask him this question, he said, was, I agree. And that's it. So you know, again, that kind of reticence, I think that in that case, somebody like Steve or Leslie would go to that group of people and sit down with them and get their story and serve as some kind of a, a you know, a amanuensis or, you know, some kind of a go-between to get them as a group, perhaps, to feel more comfortable telling the story to them and shaping it with them, and so that, therefore, then they would get that out to the national media. And, you know, I, I chose this panel because I work with these people a lot. You know, these folks are all, in, in their own way, very good at engaging with university communications. Um, it's no secret. And so what I've done is I put together a list of the news team, our contacts, what we specialize in. I'm just going to set them up here. Um, that's a big part of it, is making sure that, you know, uh, we're looped in. Makita was an intern at UCOM back when, in her undergrad days, and so she knows her way around UCOM. And, you know, like I said, is really, really understands the platforms because of that and how to, how to get that news out from SNR. And you, if you look at from the moment when she was hired from SNR, it's kind of, it just goes like this, the number of stories. So, I mean, this, she knows the sheet. She doesn't need this sheet, in other words. She knows what we do. So I'm just going to set this up here for those of you who don't know us. Uh, you know, there's been some changes in the last year or so in the, in the news team. So I'll just put them up here. Let's, um, let's thank our panel. They've been great. Thank, thank you. Sure.